Um, but that was when I started my career in Linux, uh, trying to corral these four distros into having a unified distro. It was fun until the lawsuits started flying. But that's, I'm dating myself as to when I first entered the open source marketplace um, and killing time while I'm waiting for my slides. But um, I'll, I'll talk to them, and hopefully they'll bring me a dongle in a moment. Uh, my name is Paula Hunter. I'm executive director of the Mojo Loop Foundation. Um, my last 20 years, I've been managing um, uh, nonprofit foundations in either the open source space or the standard space. Uh, up until three years ago, I was managing the Near Field Communications Technology uh, Organization, NFC Forum, which does uh, you know the technology for you know iPhones and uh, Samsung phones for wallets and uh, secure chips. Um, but I made a pivot uh, three years ago to join the, to form the Mojulu Foundation, which was a project that was um, the vision came from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation because what they wanted to do was address the, the challenges of financial inclusion, particularly in Africa, and now what we're finding in many other markets around the world. And um, what the Mojo Foundation is, is, is what it looks like a traditional open source foundation. We have a developer community, uh, we run events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're a member of Finos, and, um, but we also have some unique characteristics. And what I want to do is put it in the context of digital public goods, which is the moniker that is used for open source projects in the public goods sector. Um, usually very focused on developing markets, developing countries, highly involved with philanthropic uh, organizations that underwrite infrastructure projects, and of course, uh, the, the governments themselves. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about digital public goods um, and a specific project that we're involved with called G2P Connect, which is government to person, uh, being able to distribute payments all, uh, from, from a government to uh, citizens across their country. I'll talk a little bit about how Mojuloop is, is leveraging open source um, and happy to take any questions. So um, uh, recently, a, a German organization uh, took a stab at, at defining digital public goods, which I found very, very revealing. Uh, they said they combined three fundamental characteristics. One, they're non-rivalrous, um, which is uh, refreshing in this commercial era we live in. Non-excludable. Everyone can participate. Everyone can, can take advantage of the digital public good and globally available. Sounds similar to open source, right? You know, so DPG is a moniker that's used in this space um, that basically recharacterizes open source software as a digital public good um, because in particular, again, in developing markets and economies, um, they want to know that, uh, that the intent of this project is strictly public good. Um, why is that important? Well, uh, DPGs, um, the government agencies want to be able to have free and unfettered access. Again, all of the attributes that you would find in open source. But they have unique challenges with regard to vendor lock-in um, and being able to scale their projects. Um, and, and again, if these are government-led projects, they often don't have the resources to come to conferences like this. We recently had our, our developer conference in Tanzania in October. And you know, we have uh, Bank of Tanzania, Bank of Rwanda, uh, Guinea, all of those banks actively involved with Mojloop and getting deployments going. They can't afford to send their people to those meetings which is such a shame because we've got 100 developers from all over the world in one room for a week. They can't send uh, their, de their, their developers. So we, we pay their tickets, basically. Um, but that's why you know, have, being able to leverage and, ad and ad adapt projects that are being used elsewhere in the region are so important to them. Otherwise, they do it you know, in, a, in a narrow vision of what, how they solve the problem. Um, they don't benefit from the open source collaboration. They don't benefit from lessons learned from other projects that are scaling up. Um, they, they also really want to see that um, the project is sustainable. So, you know, I'm sure some of you have been involved with smaller open source projects. The question always comes, who's going to manage this project for the long term? Who's backing it? 
what key companies are involved in the project. And so, um, you know, just like, you know, Linux Foundation, we have member companies that have committed long range to the project. Google, for example, is one of our major committers. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about how we have kind of a hybrid model for, for managing that issue. The other thing that is critically important, and it's as part a control issue as is a pride issue, is um, country ownership, country um, you know, sovereignty over their project. So on the one hand, they understand and appreciate the benefits of open source, but they, 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 want, they want it to be their solution. Um, and we're even finding that you know, this would be a huge issue with cloud deployments. Uh, they want data sovereignty. They're very worried about data, data privacy. Uh, we'll, we'll roll out a proof of concept on, on AWS or Azure, um, but they want to do it on-prem. And, and so what happens is, is as they start building out the on-prem environment, they start realizing how attractive AWS and, um, and Azure and other cloud services are. Um, but at the government level, at the you know, top levels of you know, I, the IT agencies and stuff, there's still very much a lot of wariness, uh, and they want to do it all in-house. We're hoping to break through that over time. We're, we're agnostic. I mean, we, 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 don't, we don't care what they deploy it on, but we do think there's significant advantages of, of, of cloud-based uh, deployments. So how do DBGs, DBGs differ from open source foundations like, like Finos, who became part of Linux Foundation? Uh, typically, um, if, if founded in the United States, and we are, head, our headquarters in Massachusetts, uh, registered in Delaware, we're 501c3. So in the tax code, we're a charity we're for, for public good. Uh, Linux Foundation is a 501c6, which is a vendor-driven organization. So still not make, not a for-profit, but Linux Foundation can deliver benefits to its members. I can't. I'm a charity. Everyone has to benefit equally from what we do. It also allows us to um, accept grants from Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, UNICEF, etc. They want a CC3. They will not grant to a C6 or to a for-profit. Um, so that forced our structure. Um, but we did, what we did was we, we made it a hybrid. Um, thankfully, our attorney used to be a, the, the attorney for the Linux Foundation, so he understands how to, to merge the two scenarios. So we do have a membership structure that allows the technology companies to join, provide membership dues, provide code contribution, et cetera. I just can't deliver enhanced value to them. I can give them a more control of our mission and governance, but I can't give them unique, I can't give them discounts to attend conferences or things like that, even though our conferences are free for now. <laughs> um, and and those, that, those grants and dues go to funding our operations, our development environment. Um, we don't pay for code development, but we certainly provide DevOps and release management and uh, cloud platforms. Um, and also, we, we need money for deployment assistance because it typically, still don't have a dongle. Well, hopefully, you guys see my slides online. Um, it, it, typically, we go to a, a, a country like Rwanda, extremely visionary about I I instant payment uh, uh, delivery to their, to their citizens. Keen to do it, don't have the money. This, is, this happens in probably 80% of the opportunities we, we look at for Mojaloop. And so what happens? We go out to the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, GIZ in Germany, the, the Foundation in Norway, and we say, here's an infrastructure project that needs funding. And believe it or not, there is a lot of money out there for infrastructure projects in developing economies. What it does is it makes the deployment more complex because that has to go the whole, whole process of acquiring the grant and getting, you know, doing all the, the justifications there. But, so it, it de definitely lengthens the deployment time for these types of projects. But the good news is that there is money out there. Um, and, and so the other thing is the vendor ecosystem is not nearly as mature as what you find here in the United States and Europe and other developing markets. Uh, so, you know, the systems integrators, for example, the big ones, the Accentures, the Ernst and Youngs, et cetera, you know, they're, they're waiting and watching. 
you know, they, they do stuff for money, right? I don't begrudge them that. But in, in this situation where you have an emerging platform in emerging markets, they're saying, should we invest the resources to become fluent in MojaLoop or any other DPG? Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is convince them, yes, there is opportunity. We're not anti-capitalism. Um, we're happy to have people make money selling and deploying services on these projects. Um, it just takes time for them to get up to, to, to embrace them. Uh, in the meantime, what we're doing is working in countries and building out systems, systems integrators' expertise to help deploy, implement and deploy and operate modular-based systems. Again, another layer of complexity, but it just speaks to the, um, you know, the nascent uh, status of this industry. So the, the ecosystem for, for digital public goods includes, first and foremost, the grant-making entities. I could not breathe without funds from Gates Foundation, Rockefeller, et cetera. Um, there's also government-funded initiatives and NGOs, uh, UNCDF, Digital Impact Alliance, you know, there's acronym soup there all kinds of entities that are trying to advance financial inclusion, trying to advance public, public infrastructure projects. Um, and so they might bring money or expertise to, to bear in advocacy, education, et cetera. Uh, we also need the technology vendors. Um, I'd show you the logos, but I don't have my screens. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, the Googles and the Modus boxes and the coils and ripples that are part of our, our membership. Uh, we work closely with Microsoft on the Azure uh, variants, um, all, all, you know, what you would see in, in a traditional open source foundation. Systems integrators are key, very important. I'll use the example of Rwanda earlier. Again, visionary with regard to what they want to deliver to their citizens for instant payments. Uh, don't have the funds, um, don't have the expertise. So we just secured eight and a half million dollars to do this project in Rwanda. Yay, let's get started. Guess what? Rwanda's IT group doesn't have the bandwidth or expertise to start the project. And you know, you can't deploy a complex instant payment switch in, in a country that's gonna serve the central bank and all the, all the financial institutions in that country without the central bank at the table and their IT department talking about the requirements and such. So that just, again, adds time and complexity to the project. I'm hopeful, we're, we, have meet, we had meetings last week in Rwanda. Um, they're starting to free up some resources to start this project. But again, it's, um, it just adds new, uh, you know, just additional challenges to deployments. Even if the money's there, they don't necessarily have the bandwidth or capacity on in-country to do the work. Um, and so as an organization, in addition to providing that matchmaking service, uh, the DPGs, we have to find uh, funders for these infrastructure projects. Um, but we also provide, um, oh, oh, I, I have staff for open source product management, DevOps, release management, work stream management, uh, testing, uh, providing the infrastructure, whether it be you know, uh, the cloud-based infrastructure, community management, advocacy and education operations. So all the things that you, know, that you, you enjoy from the Linux Foundation, we, we supply to our community as well. Um, and again, just based on the, on, on the funding from those various sources. Uh, so some of the challenges in the DPG world, and then I'll get to a specific example here in a moment. Um, the, 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 as you know, the development model is, of, of open source is dependent on contributors. Well, this, first of all, central banks are wary of, of making contributions. Nothing new, even in your in, in a developed markets. So, you know, they they enjoy open source here. They've gotten a little more involved. They're starting to join some projects. But you guys, you know, we've been doing open source in, in fintech here in the states for twenty years. You know, I was coming down to Wall Street twenty years ago. Central banks in in developing markets. Um, this is all new uh, to them, and so you know. You got to walk before you run. I don't see con contributions back to our code base from central banks for some time. What I can do is if I find funding for a project, I can make terms of the funding be you have to give back. So that's a little lever that, that we can leverage. As I said, many of the developing countries lack the skills and the capacity um, to, 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 uh, to actually start the projects. Um, and and, and as, I, as I said before, the markets are not fully evolved. So the big players are still 
waiting and watching. They come to our events. They know about Mojo Loop. They've, they've probably run it in-house, but they're not going to train up their team until they start seeing momentum in the marketplace, which is coming. Um, the, the, the ecosystem is highly dependent on a philanthropic uh, funding for these deployments, which lengthens the sales cycle um, and, and lengthens the, the, the deployment cycle. Um, and, you know, the grants, you know, they're our lifeblood. Um, there's many, many millions of dollars of fund, funds available. Gates Foundation just announced a 20 million grant to co-develop yesterday as a group that we're participating with on this next project I'm going to talk about. So this project I wanted to, to cite as an example is called G2P Connect. It's um, an, an open source collaboration effort to bring government to person payments to market. Um, and you know, envision yourself a refugee in Jordan. You have the clothes on your back. That's it. Jordan has, has been very generous in providing resources and funds to, uh, they have a very large refugee population. Um, but they have to distribute cash, which is risky. Um, and these people have to hold on to the cash, which is risky. Um, and, you know, cash is inefficient. It's dirty and it's inefficient. And even other more developed economies in, in I was in Singapore in March, no one would accept cash. Because of COVID, they view it as dirty. Um, and, and it's true. I mean, cash is dirty. Let's, let's face it. The more we, less we can do with cash, the better. Um, so if a government, and this even holds true in the United States, can distribute aid payments um, via uh, you know, electronic means, it's more efficient, it's clean, more hygienic, and um, it's less risky for the recipient. So what we need to do, uh, unfortunately, is a lot of these refugees and, and recipients of this aid don't have bank accounts, but they all have phones. Not smartphones. You're not, I think Apple's market share in Africa is 7%. Um, you know, if you're in Joburg, you're going to see iPhones. If you're in, you know, in, you know, Arusha, you're not. You're going to see just flip phones and, and some feature phones. But they all can scan QRs, right? And, there's, and they, all, they all can have some type of uh, wallet-based systems. So deploying this uh, as, as a um, collaborative effort um, is, is going to allow us to, to prove to these governments that they can deliver pay, payments, aid payments, et cetera, uh, using open source technologies. So the, this vision came from the World Bank, um, which obviously is, over, is, is seeing these, this opportunity and need across the world. And what they did was pull together a number of open source projects or digital public goods, including Mojaloop, uh, MoSEP, MIFOS, OpenSPP, all acronym soup. It's in my deck when you see it, whenever you see it. <laughs> um, but think about it. In, this summer, they called, and, you know, they called and said, we need to do a demonstration for the World Bank in October at their annual conference. All the countries will be there. And we want to see you knit together eight open source projects for a demonstration. And guess what? These eight open source projects, you're talking about 40 time zones. It's, it, it's maddening trying to get it all done because you've got, you know, all across Africa, Europe, Asia, North America, East Coast, West Coast. There is no good time to have a call. None. Someone's, you know, in their pajamas or having their first sip of coffee. Um, but we were able to pull together and really uh, define a specification for government to person payments uh, as a blueprint um, that would also can also be extended and enhanced to add other benefits to, to uh, these recipients. Um, so, so while the focus right now is G2P, there's other scenarios and use cases that we could, we could um, address through, through this integrated uh, platform. Uh, so just to give you a sense of the components, and as I said, there's one, two, three, seven open source projects. Uh, there's, there's scheme management, there's payment and settlement services, there's uh, bank or mobile wall wallet uh, systems, and then last, last mile cash in, cash out systems. 
So what we needed to do is knit together the, these, these, these solutions, make sure our APIs could talk to another to create a demonstration. We succeeded. We did a, a smoke and mirrors demonstration to the World Bank in October, but the project continues. And now we're, you know, now that we've gotten through that first fire drill, we have momentum. We've coalesced all these different communities together uh, 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 against this purpose. Um, there, there's a website, there's links, there's a, a GitHub link and discussion forum. Uh, again, you'll see it on the slides. So um, I'm going to just give a, a few more uh, pieces of information about Mojaloop, and then I can take questions. So the vision for Mojaloop was to address financial inclusion. Uh, most commercial banks are not delivering services out to rural populations in developing countries. So if you're a woman that has a little bodega on the side of the road, you get a microfinance loan to, to cover your inventory. And then at the end of the week, you walk to, uh, a, uh, to, to an exchange where you can cash in, pay your microfinance loan, maybe cash back out for, to pay someone else. Every time you cash in and cash out or pay, make a payment, um, you're, you're paying a transaction fee. Now, th this person might live off of $100 a month. So every transaction fee cuts into her income, probably $20 a month in fees. We want to drop, we want to get rid of those transaction fees, get rid of the middlemen if we can, uh, so that she can take her phone and pay her, pay, make a payment to her microfinance loan rather than having to walk two miles to, to someone that's going to transfer the funds for. Her. Uh, so what's really important is A, interoperability. I mean, if you go in, like, like recently in Tanzania, I was at a merchant. They had like eight card readers for different credit card companies. It's, it's not interoperable. I mean, where's the MV going? You need them. <laughs> I rarely say that, but, um, you know, it's, it's real. And each, the merchant has to pay for each terminal. Uh, and, of course, they're paying transaction costs. So it's just, there's a lot of inefficiency in the system. So have interoperability not only between the different merchants, but also the different card companies, different banks, and the mobile network operators. Um, so knitting all that, those people together. The, and providing instantaneous uh, payments. In some cases, they had to wait 24 hours or, or longer for a payment to settle. Um, we, got, we got to get rid of that. We, we, we don't realize how, how uh, easy it is to, to deal with money and digital digital transactions here in the, in the States until you, until you get out into some of these remote regions. Um, we advocate for push payments, not pull. Um, need, obviously need to address the, the regulators and central bank requirements, and every country is different. Um, so that, again, uh, we need to be on the ground and make sure that we're not doing things that break the, the, you know, the regulatory environment in a particular country. And obviously have to uh, have various levels of KYC. So, you know, as, as a central switch, um, we're really um, trying to help hub operators with, with banks and non-banks to exchange uh, payments. We're not end user focused at all. So no one's going to be able to tell you what Mojo, you know, tell you about Mojaloop on the ground as a citizen in any of these countries. By the way, anyone know what the word Moja means? Anyone? I've got, a, I've got another gift, a prize. Moja, huh? No, Moja is Swahili for one. One loop, one integrated loop for all. Um, and it, it, what we want to do is connect existing infrastructure as required, ACH, POS, ATM. Um, so we're not trying to replace what's on the ground, but make it more efficient and interoperability, uh, interoperable. Um, and... Um, and where possible, reduce costs, reduce transaction fees, um, and make it more accessible to, to people that are in remote and rural locations. The core technologies, just for, for the sake of the folks, uh, the open source uh, techies in the room, Docker, Kubernetes, Linux, Helm, JavaScript, no, Node.js, Rancher, MySQL, Kafka, Interledger, I've probably forgotten a few, but obviously, thank you all for the contribution of those, those open source code uh, bases because we're highly dependent on them. As I mentioned, um, we, we advocate for cloud-based deployments, but we're agnostic. Uh, our development environment is AWS. 
um, Azure, Microsoft just came in and optimized our, us for, for Azure. So we can roll out a proof of concept in two hours uh, to, you know, to, to a, a bank on, on, cloud, on a, AWS or Azure very quickly. Um, but again, if they want to do it on-prem, that's fine. Proof of, if we can get proof of concepts up and running quickly, it allows them to kick the tires and, and, and discuss additional use cases. So um, it, it, this is motherhood and apple pie, but again, I've been in open source for 20 years. I forget the value of open source is not fully understood worldwide. You guys, you know, it's your, you know, it's in your DNA. That's not true globally. Um, so, at, you know, really um, emphasizing the fact that by participating in an open source community, uh, your deployment is part of this community of developers that can add features and enhancements and maintenance. And if you decide to add another plug-on or, or, or feature, it can be rolled back into the core, tested by the community. You don't have to maintain it. Very appealing to them. It's just, you know, they don't under, they don't, they've not really benefited from it thus far. It also allows for fee structures that match their needs. In a lot of cases, some of the proprietary software vendors are going into these, these countries and saying, yeah, we can, we can manage and deploy a switch. Oh, we're going to take a piece of each transaction. That doesn't help drive transaction costs down. Uh, not very appealing. Um, and then, you know, it, it, what it does is, is it builds out a community, and, and that's why it's so important for us to get them to our community meetings. You know, if they're on an edge of deployment or a proof of concept, they can come in a room with 100 other people that know, you know, Modulo deeply. Um, it, it's, it, the light bulb comes on. They realize, oh, I have this whole set of uh, resources that I can touch base with on, on GitHub or Slack or whatever channel. Um, so it's... it's um, it, the proof is in the pudding when they, you know, they come in and they spend time with their developers for a week or so. Um, it, it makes all the difference. Right now, our, develop, our, our community, not just development, but our community at large is about 1,400 people in, on six continents, 47 countries, um, and we have 10 spot, uh, technology sponsor members. Um, so getting, you know, at each convening that we hold, we, we, hold, we, we hold two a year now that COVID's gone. Um, we, we typically get 100 to 110 people. And out of that 110 people, we usually have at least 35 countries represented. So it's a very diverse uh, global community. Some notable projects, I've, I've, I've mentioned a few already, uh, but Tanzania, Tanzania Instant Payment System. Um, that project started five years ago and had a few false starts along the way, but they are live. And when we were in Zanzibar in October, we were able to go around to merchants and be able to see people with different mobile network, mobile phones, different mobile network operators, different wallets, make merchant payments, do cash in, do cash out. They could not do that before this year. Um, so those are all things that are um, being deployed in, in, in Tanzania. Um, there's 62 banks that are being knit together right now. They, I think they have five already in the system uh, and, and two MNOs, but they're going up to all seven MNOs on the continent um, and really hoping to, to uh, reach at least 70 to 80 percent of their population with this new platform. Uh, another uh, situation, Myanmar. <laughs> Imagine how hard it is to do business in Myanmar right now even to get into Myanmar. Thank God for the web, right? Uh, because we've done this project almost all, all remotely. Um, and in fact, uh, this, this Storks is the, um, the lead systems integrator that's running this uh, project in Myanmar. They're actually the CEOs here in New York City. Um, and what they've done is they've developed, with, with funding from UNCDF, um, a platform um, that provides loan repayment and loan distribution for, in, in, particularly in the agricultural sector, but they want to expand and add peer-to-peer -peer payments and G2P payments. Um, and so that's just, this project has just gone live in the last few weeks. Uh, Visa is also helping fund that project. Um, I've mentioned Rwanda a number of times. Uh, Rwanda's use cases include peer-to-peer, P2G, P2B, and B2P. <laughs> How's that for acronym soup? Um, but they want to be able to um, engage about 124 agents in Rwanda and over 5 million um, mobile money subscribers. 
Rwanda is a relatively small country, so the numbers aren't, aren't quite as, as, as compelling. But um, in essence, what we want to do is build an ecosystem that benefits everyone. Great news for the fintechs. I mean, we're leapfrogging from a technology standpoint. In a lot of cases, there ain't no legacy systems in place for payment sw switches and hubs in, the, in these countries. And if they are, they're very rudimentary. So it's a great opportunity for the fintechs um, to become involved in these projects and then differentiate at the customer level and create new, uh, new service offerings uh, to, in the marketplace. So um, the fintechs really have a leg up in this respect because they're not competing with the big banks. The big banks aren't in these rural markets. They aren't, they aren't servicing them today. There are no branch banks. Um, so it's a great opportunity. Central banks, of course, are, are critical in all these instances, in, in all these areas. I mean, obviously, the Federal Reserve, we have great respect for them here in the United States. But you don't cross the central bank of Rwanda. You don't cross the central bank of Tanzania. You don't get anything done if you're not in the loop with them. Um, so, so they're a critical part of our, our dialogue in these countries. Um, merchants merchants are, are, are going to benefit from these, these, these solutions. First of all, get rid of you know seven or eight different readers in, in, in each kiosk. And you know, some of these little tiny, I mean, they're tinier than a corner CVS, and they've got you know, all these key, all these uh, readers and such. Um, so, so really, providing services to them is, is very important as well. Um, so anyway, I, I apologize for the lack of slides. I'm not sure what happened, but. Um, I was able to I was able to see them, but you can you, you'll be able to download them and and I'm happy at my email address phunter at mojaloop.io is on the slides, but you're free to contact me, LinkedIn, what what have you. Um, so any questions from the room? A question gets a prize. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is part of the consideration. I mean, one of the problems with refugees, as you imagine, that they're coming in with no ID. So they, have, you know, that's why a G to P payment sometimes can't be dependent on um, the bona fides that we would expect in in a market like ours. Uh, but there is a, a project called MOSIP, it, it being run out of uh, India, that that we were integrating with. So we're collaborating with them. We we don't do the ID aspects of of the, you know the payment ecosystem. So partnering with BOSIP has been been um, important, but also having the flexibility to have other mechanisms for people to have an account without necessarily the type of traditional ID we we, we enjoy here in the states. Do you have a question or no? Anyone else? I have lots of clarifying questions. Sure. Um, so you have very No, we don't have any products. We're plumbing. We're plumbing. It can, it, it can leverage blank chain, blockchain, but you know we are the we are below a blockchain. Um, so we're creating APIs for people to transmit any type of funds across a Mojo Loop switch. That's dependent on the, the hub operator and the banks. Uh, so they decide if there's an upper limit. In our cases, what we're looking at mostly is high volume, low value transactions. And once you start getting into high value, they're already served. They have bank accounts. We're talking about low, low, you know, dollar transactions. Yeah, yeah. So India has made tremendous progress through the UPI, and uh, you know that's where we're we're compatible uh, as, in a similar um, philosophy to what UPI is doing. Um, you know, I, I can't compete with you know WhatsApp and the commercial sector on payments, and the governments um, have to have uh, it, depending on the government. They may or may not allow WhatsApp to have the level of autonomy that they have in a developed market. Um, so, making sure that there's an instant payment switch that is central bank endorsed and approved is, is critically important.
it's a whole different world. Um, you know, and, and of course, the, you know, the, the folks like WhatsApp are trying to get into these markets because they do small payments well. Um, but you can't do it in a vacuum. You know, oh, sorry, throw a ball at it. Possibly. Um, I know we talked to the National Association of Credit Unions, um, uh, not me personally, but uh, one of my, my delegates, um, as a way to have a new, um, you know, a, a new pipeline. That, that is interoperable. But I, I, I don't spend any time talking to US market actors um, because their needs um, are, we, right now would be a distraction for us. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> I'm a terrible pitcher. <laughs> so I don't blame anyone for the non-catch. Yeah. 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 I mean, that that need is is universal, um, and what's available on the ground during a disaster is kind of that's the closest you come to being similar to the developing markets that are rural and um, unbanked. Yeah. 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 COVID, yeah, okay. aid payments, and, you know, welfare payments, whatever, yeah. Yeah, the, the interest level spiked tr tremendously during the COVID era. Again, part because of uh, it, what was going on, but, you know, just trying to get away from cash. Cross-border, oh, I could spend another two hours talking about cross-border. <laughs> Um, we actually are working on a project with the Monetary Authority of Singapore to try and do some pilot projects. Um, like in like um, Hong Kong, you have a lot of a very large Filipino population, uh, domestic workers that want to send money home. They have to cash in. There's a big currency transaction, cash out at home. Boy, those fees just kill them. Um, so uh, Hong Kong, um, Singapore, a lot of places where there's there's what's called migrant workers, not not necessarily agricultural migrants, but um, different types of migrants. Um, that's a huge issue for the cross-border transactions. So yes, we we are piloting some projects on that right now. And I'll give. I'm not going to throw a ball at you. It's too far. How about I have two left? And you get the set last one. Um, push is you're sending to the recipient rather than you pulling money from them. I mean, like right now, if um, in my Comcast or AT&T, they pull money from my bank account. Um, there's a whole bunch of issues with that um, in a developing market. First, if they don't have a bank account, you just want to push to a wallet. Um, so we are not yet interested in addressing pull because we're dealing with unbanked people. Um, and, uh, and there's a level of trust that's just not there yet. Um, not, the market's just not demanding it as yet. Resources, resources, tech talent, yeah. Yeah, like the Rwanda team, they, they, they were trying to roll out another project. They couldn't, I mean, we could, we could throw them all the money in the world. They didn't have anyone to catch it and say, okay, now let's start working. Um, so they, they just, uh, so what we've been doing is training systems integrators in Rwanda that could uh, augment their, their IT team so they could get the project going. I mean, we could fly people in from all over the world, but it's not, yeah, it's not scalable. And it's back to that sovereignty. People want, you know, they want their local economy to benefit from this. So if we can, in parallel, train up resources, that's, that's a better long-term model. Is 
Exactly. Yep, yep. It's whatever the mobile network operator or the financial institution wants it to be. What we're, again, we're the plumbing, and we want, you know, whether it's a wallet or an app or whatever, that when that user says, send this money, it comes through our pipes. No, no, that's, that's the, we're working with the operators and the banks to design uh, or supplement apps they already have. Uh, to tap into it, but we're not at the consumer-facing level at all. But everything is pretty much stuttered around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one good thing of, uh, you know, the technology advancements. I mean, think about it. We didn't, you know, t 10 years ago, how many people here in the States had mobile phones? Now look at it, everyone. That's the same in, in Africa. So they don't, you know, they're not at least dealing with, you know, that, uh, you know, again, not sophisticated, uh, Samsung phones or Apple phones, but sufficient uh, capability to, to make a, a tr to conduct a transaction. Cost of cost of implementing a oh, proof of concept free. <laughs> to spin it up on AWS or Azure or on the Azure Marketplace. Um, so. You know, obviously, if you don't have your own cloud environment, if, if you're a developing economy, we'll find the money to spin it up. It's, it's, not, it's not significant. Um, it's just whatever it costs. To, it, it's, you know, we can get into uh, testing f fake money very quickly and very cheaply. It's so when you start going into that next phase of uh, testing real money that it requires a lot more uh, resources and uh, touch points uh, to make those integrations. Well, if you're a fintech, a commercial entity, we're not going to do it for you for free. <laughs> you're welcome to, 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 to kick the tires. You're welcome to download the code. It's on GitHub. Uh, we have called uh, uh, Mini Loop, which is a way to, in an hour, do a full install of Moja Loop. So it doesn't require a lot of resources. Our Mini Loop guy could walk you through it. Um, but, you know, the... The, the subsidy goes to the non to the to the government agencies and the nonprofits, um, but the fintechs. We're trying to make it as painless as possible for you to spin it up, test it out, and see if you want to extend and enhance from there. Well, I appreciate you uh, your patience without slides, but um, thanks for your questions. And, <laughs>